Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Psychedelics Today. Today on the show, we have Manish Gurn, a PhD candidate in neuroscience at McGill University. And also you have a wonderful YouTube channel called The Psychedelic Scientist. So really breaking down the neuroscience. I, f- I think I first stumbled across your work either on Instagram and watched some of the YouTube. And I just loved how you were able to break it down in like layman's term be like, okay, here's, here's somebody that can help us really understand some of this complex neuroscience around psychedelics. So really excited to have you here today today. Um, do you want to give the listeners a little bit more of background about your work and, and who you are? Yeah, totally. Yeah. So it's a huge pleasure to be chatting with you guys today and really glad you've been enjoying my YouTube videos. Um, so yeah, you basically said it. So I'm a PhD student in neuroscience over at McGill University. Uh, kind of my PhD research is on one side, looking at the default mode network and characterizing in different ways. How, how does it relate to different aspects of our thinking, et cetera. And then in another half, you could say I I'm collaborating with Rob McCarr Hart Harris and um, a couple other people at the Imperial College Center for Psychedelic Research, uh, basically looking at their fMRI data, their brain imaging data, and seeing similarities and differences across psilocybin, DMT, and LSD, kind of applying different analyses to their data sets, et cetera. Um, so yeah, so default mode network, psychedelics in the brain, that's kind of me and my research. And then, uh, yeah, also the YouTube channel, because, you know, I found... A lot of the coverage on psychedelics in the media is very sensationalistic. A lot of times simplified. It's like, oh, you know, turn off your default mode network and reset your brain and all this kind of stuff, which makes a lot of neuroscientists cringe sometimes uh, when you look mm-hmm. at the actual data and what the results specifically say, et cetera. And so I wanted to find uh, a kind of middle ground almost where I'm faithful to the science. It's rigorous and not kind of over-interpreting. Um, but at the same time, uh, layperson friendly. So the average person without a scientific background can understand it. And kind of that's what I've been aiming to do with my channel. And also it's a way t- for me to show my family and friends, you know, what it is I'm up to. Because like, <laughs> oh, man, she studies those drugs. Uh, and like, I kind of want them to understand it a bit more. So that's another motive there. Super cool. Awesome. How's your friends and family uh, receiving some of that? Yeah, very positive. I mean, my mom shares my videos widely to the family. Oh, so like, nice. there's no, I'm 100% out of the psychedelic closet, which is, which is great because, I mean, uh, it's allowing them to uh, see this whole another world and just open them up to it with a newer perspective and kind of overriding beliefs they might have had formed 10 years ago, you know, from all the, all the drug, uh, quote unquote, education people get <laughs> around these things. Um, so it's been great. It's honestly been great. I haven't had any resistance from family or friends about it at all. Yeah, that's beautiful. Mm, wonderful. Yeah, I'm a big fan of your YouTube channel. I think it really breaks things down in just such a digestible way, which is hard when you're trying to read the actual, you know, clinical data, the peer-reviewed papers. If you're not a PhD candidate, it's like, I really want to, and I'm trying my hardest. And then to also have you as a resource to like break it down in this kind of like if I was going to a university course on this and how the professor would break it down for us. And so I really enjoy it. Mm. I think it's like a really great resource. I was really curious, you know, how did you get interested just in psychedelics in general, maybe before we dive into some of your research and the brain stuff? For sure. So I think it it started around 16 or 17 years old. Um, (laughs) And uh, during that time, you know, high school is a rough time. And uh, I was kind of you know, the classic situation where my friends from elementary were now turning on me and kind of bullying me in a variety of ways. Mm. And uh, I was going through not the best of times. And this career counselor dude who worked at uh, the high, my high school, bit of an interesting character. He recommended me this book on Zen Buddhism. Mm. Okay. So that's kind of how it started. I got really into meditation and Eastern spirituality and mysticism, you know, consciousness, all this kind of stuff by reading that book. It was called The Three Pillars of Zen by Roshi Kaplow, a very famous book. And I went from there reading a whole bunch of other books, um, you know, yoga, Eastern philosophy. And eventually I came across Stan Groff's LSD Doorway to the Numinous. And reading that, I was, nice. that, that really inspired it, right? Because like he, in that book, offers his own cartography of the LSD experience, et cetera, and describes the range of states that people go into. You know, some of these, of course, overlapping with mystical experiences and states reported by mystics and yogis, et cetera. And I was like, this is fascinating. Like, here's a drug that can induce all these states. And in addition to that, you know, be used to help uh, different disorders and be used as treatment. Yet, you know, this is not acknowledged. People think you, you know, take LSD or psilocybin, you kind of go crazy. Uh, and, or it's a kind of a party drug almost. 
that was my perception initially and the perception of my peers. And I was like, oh, there's so much more to it. It's fascinating. And, uh, you know, allows a window into different realms of experience that are inaccessible uh, usually, and therefore can allow us to study us and study what it means to be human almost in a greater totality, right? So then I was like super inspired by that. And that inspired me to study. Originally, I wanted to study psychology and philosophy for my undergrad. And then I kind of uh, eventually got involved with the neuroscience lab at UBC where they do med- they were doing uh, stuff on daydreaming, mind wandering, and some meditation stuff. And that pulled me into cognitive neuroscience and that's kind of what I'm pursuing now. Awesome. Mm-hmm. And my first entry point to Groff was that same book. I'm actually really surprised um, how many people are introduced to the psychedelic landscape through Groff's work. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, I believe Robin was too, Robin Carhart. He was. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think yeah, that yeah. was Realms of the Human Unconscious, which I think they reprinted into uh, LSD Doorway to the Numinous. Yeah, so, yeah, I believe so. Yeah. Yeah. So the same content, yeah, inspires a lot of people. It, it's a very, very profound book. And it's, if you're not familiar with the space, that's a lot to just, you know, be introduced to in one book. So. It's a dense book, right? <laughs> yeah, I'm always really surprised when people say that Groff was their first introduction. Because to me, I'm like, I was reading more like the the 60s, like literature, like psychedelic acid test and that kind of thing, because it was easier to read. <laughs> but um, But yeah, it's like... But then once you get deeper and you get into, yeah, reading about just the the philosophy and all of Groff's work, it's just, it is inspiring too. And it's really cool that then you took it to this next level. And uh, yeah. So I guess like totally. I do want to talk about how psychedelics work in the brain and your current work, but you just kind of touched on, you know, your initial work in cognitive neuroscience, this like... Um, You did some, you're a co-author on a paper on meditation and daydreaming, right? Would you talk about a little bit about your early work and then maybe how it led to where you are today and some of the things you found? Totally, totally. So like my vision to pursue a career as a psychedelic researcher was to first get my feet into areas that are related, but that are already more established perhaps, right? And then leverage those into the psychedelic space to have my own unique approach. Cool. And, um, and this lab was like basically a perfect match for me. And, uh, some of the people I met in there, I have as mentors, probably lifelong career long mentors, awesome people. And yeah, so this lab was the cognitive neuroscience of thought lab uh, at UBC, uh, in Vancouver. And, uh, they were interesting in characterizing different types of thought, but in particular mind wandering. So thoughts that come, you know, spontaneously during the other day. And trying to characterize those and like, you know, what are the dimensions of mind wandering? How does mind wandering, how can it vary? Um, How does it relate to the brain? How does it relate to mental health conditions and this kind of thing? And of course, in that space, meditation almost goes hand in hand because it's fundamentally a matter of changing your relationship to your ongoing stream of thought, right? Kind of uh, in one sense, like trying to create a distance between you and your thought content such that you're able to see it from this broader perspective and not get too intertwined with it. That's kind of what meditation is in in a lot of aspects. And so, yeah, so then in in this, in the context of that lab, I did this study, actually my first ever study was um, using EEG. So, you know, you put electrodes on their head and you measure their electrical activity of neurons and having experienced meditators. So we got this like, you know, there's multiple meditation communities that we recruited from in BC and um, had them sit there and they're meditating like a Vipassana style of meditation, or actually, uh, I believe it's Anapana, or I believe that's what it's called. It's focusing on your breathing basically. And we asked them, every time you notice a thought capturing your attention, press a button, oh, cool. right? And so we had them sitting there for half an hour or, or whatever. And, uh, and then we have this kind of um, uh, set of events of them saying like, oh, a thought arose here. And then we took like the two seconds before every one of those events and like what happened in the brain to give rise to mm. a new spontaneous thought. Um, so we did that and, uh, you know, results. What did you notice Yeah, there? what, what happens? Yeah. Well, <laughs> Well, for one, there was a a distinct pattern of activity that seemed to occur, um, in the, in the, like, I believe it was even a few seconds before, something like 20 seconds before, uh, kind of, um, perhaps representing the thought bubbling from these kind of subconscious layers and coming up. Um, and it was, uh, if I remember there were regions, I think within the default mode network and also a network called the salience network, 
which is basically involved in a number of things, but also just like orienting our attention. You know, if you see, if you're, if you're looking at an environment and there's like a red light all of a sudden and you flip through it, that's kind of the sense salience network. It kind of tags things that are salient in your environment. So it seems certain regions within these two networks were kind of interacting with each, with each other in that period before. Um, and, uh, and there was actually a larger study that did this similar paradigm, but with fMRI, which is a much uh, more precise way of measuring the brain, you could say. Uh, and they found also default mode network related changes, et cetera, uh, related to the spontaneous, to spontaneously arising thoughts and meditation. So interesting. Yeah. Super fascinating. I just had like a random thought as you're talking, you're talking about thoughts coming out of the subconscious. And I guess from like a neuroscience perspective, you know, do we understand like where the subconscious is? What is the subconscious? Like where do those thoughts even originate from? Are they just neural activity firing and stored somewhere? And ch -ch -ch -ch. Yeah, yeah. No, it's interesting. <laughs> and honestly, we don't really know, right? And I guess I was using subconscious uh, loosely in the sense of below the threshold of our conscious awareness at that time. And, um, you know, the fMRI version of the study I ran found that regions within the hippocampus were the first to come online in that period. And the hippocampus is a area related, like the main memory area in the brain, you could say. And, um, you know, and it's involved in a whole variety of things. Uh, and so it seems that this hippocampus is kind of firing and is ongoing processing all the time. And through some like maybe competitive mechanisms uh, from that, certain thoughts will be selected to move up into our awareness. So it's like th there can very well be a stream of thought ongoing all the time, but we're just not able to perceive it yet. And then certain thoughts from that matrix of thoughts can bubble up. Um, mm. and I think research is starting to show how that works, but it's, it's very hard because, uh, you have to be very precise in your measurements to, to get that kind of stuff. And, and also like, it's hard to come by meditation practitioners with, you know, tens of uh, thousands of experience who can actually note with any reliability when a thought arises, right? Cause that's not, that's almost a superhuman feat in itself, <laughs> right? So. That's what I keep thinking. Yeah. <laughs> But, um, uh, and this now, so I just keep thinking when you're talking about, you know, these thoughts arising and where they come from seems really related to this research on creativity that you're involved in, right? Because where does creativity come from? Yeah. Where do these new ideas, where does art, where does music, where, <laughs> right? And so I do want to talk about yeah. that a lot, but I guess maybe what makes a little bit more sense is first, let's get like a a basic framework of like maybe how psychedelics are working in the brain and how it's related then to creativity, right? And this is kind of part of where your YouTube channel is so cool and your expertise really fits in because I know you can explain this stuff really well. <laughs> so, um, yeah, do you want to start right. there? Like, yeah, so like, <laughs> let's start with maybe like, yeah, like psilocybin or the serotonin, oh, the serotonin, <laughs> 2A receptor. Serotonergic. Thank you. Why can't I say that word? Yeah. <laughs> Psychedelic. I always, I I always trip over that word too. Um, like, yeah, what's, what's totally, going totally, on? Totally, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so obviously there's a lot, right? But uh, so, okay, so basically, so we're talking about the serotonergic psychedelics, mainly psilocybin, LSD, and, you know, DMT slash ayahuasca. Um, there's also mescaline, of course, but mescaline also has uh, different affinities at different receptors than the other three. So it's kind of different and there's less research on it in terms of human uh, neuroimaging. But um, yeah, so let's say psilocybin, LSD, DMT, um, they act primarily on the two-way receptor to mediate their psychedelic effects and also their changes to the brain. And so uh, basically act as if there's serotonin at this receptor. So this is a receptor that exists for serotonin and psychedelics, these psychedelics seem to latch onto it and activate it to some degree. And um, what's interesting about the two-way receptor is that it seems to be selectively located in areas of the brain that are most interconnected. They're kind of like the hubs in brain traffic, right? They mediate all sorts of connections across distributed areas in your brain um, and overlap significantly with the default mode network. And so one of the effects of two-way activation on neurons is that it increases their excitability. So it makes them more likely to fire. And also it makes them more likely to fire in kind of this almost diffuse way where let's say there's a neighborhood of 10 neurons and the one in the middle gets activated, the two-way receptor, um, the activation uh, actually can spread through those other 10 neurons uh -huh. or other nine in this context, uh, through this kind of, um, uh, what's called it's, 
how do I say this without getting too technical, but like serotonin, the two-way activation leads to glutamate release. And glutamate is a neurotransmitter that increases the activity of neurons. And so there seems to be a diffusion almost of glutamate activity through those neurons. Um, in this like non, kind of this almost non-specific kind of like in, increase in excitability around it. Um, and there's so much we can go into on like, you know, does that relate to the non-specific amplification of unconscious material that Stan Groff talks about? Maybe it's very well possible. Uh, we haven't like, you know, definitively shown that or, you know, shown it statistically, but it seems plausible. But, um, but to bring it back, so neurons become more excitable and particularly neurons at the hubs of the brain network. And therefore, this can lead to increased connectivity all around, right? Right. Uh, relatively all around, but especially involving those high-level hub regions. So these hub regions all of a sudden start becoming more interconnected with the rest of the brain because now they're hyper excitable. And then now your brain is in this hyper interconnected state. And also, since there are more possible connections, the brain has a greater set of possible states it can go into just because there's more to work with, right? And so now you get this greater dynamic complexity of brain states also that you can enter into. Um, and so we could say that psychedelics via serotonin 2 way agonism or activation lead to this uh, interconnected and almost entropic and dynamically complex mode of brain activity. Um, and, uh, and yeah, like that's, there's more to it, but like, that's a general idea we can use as a, as a working model of how it works, of how they work. And then from that, uh, this seems to lead to a variety of different changes, you know, in our emotion, perception, sense of self, uh, thinking, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, and then I guess I want to oh, no, go back to, to something that you mentioned in the beginning of like, you know, mainstream news reporting like default mode network. And then, so how do you describe that? And how do you make sense of psychedelics in this whole default mode network um, theory? Totally. Um, so psychedelics do, uh, you know, according to certain analysis techniques, reduce integration within the default mode network. I say certain analysis techniques because other ones don't really show that. Huh. And to answer why, that's like a very nuanced neuroscience analysis thing. But, um, but also more importantly, perhaps, is that default mode network, the default mode network is not the only network that's made less integrated. Basically, almost all networks in the brain are made less integrated. The majority of them are. And um, basically, the whole brain is moving into this um, kind of mode of functioning where distinct networks are less integrated, but they're more integrated between each other, right? right? So everything's mm -hmm. less differentiated in a sense. And the default mode network is one of many networks that this happens to, right? And um, so there's by no means is the default mode network particularly special from that lens. Mm -hmm. um, but the default mode network has been uniquely correlated with ego dissolution in a couple of studies, uh, but not all studies. They're having studies with psilocybin and LSD uh, that didn't find that correlation, um, but some have. And this is also a product of the infancy of the field where kind of sample sizes are quite small. And we know in brain imaging research, you need a, a really large sample size to get reliable correlations with experiences. And so, um, so it's unclear whether that link is truly there. And furthermore, I would argue that, you know, a lot of it is in the context of default mode network and ego dissolution, right? And but when we think about what is ego dissolution really, and one, we don't really know. Mm -hmm. uh, two, it seems to be this complex phenomenon um, which uh, perhaps can be separated into two distinct aspects, which I've argued for actually in a paper I wrote previously, is that one is that it alters kind of our sense of bodily self, right? So our sense of being like, this body is me, I end where my skin ends, you know, this desk, this chair is distinct from me, um, et cetera. This is the size of my body, et cetera, right? And obviously all these things can be altered under a psychedelic. You know, we can melt into our couch. We can feel like our arm is bigger than the rest of our body, or it, it could be anything, right? It could be craziness. And then uh, on the other side is uh, our sense of self and rooted in our identity. Yeah. Who we are, who, who was I previously? Who am I going to be? What are my personality traits? My so-called autobiographical sense of self. And so these two are, are distinct in the brain for all we know. And one is rooted more in areas related to you know, body sensations, the, our, our sense of spatial location. And the other one is rooted in our memories and concepts and, you know, memories of experiences and conceptual memory. And so I would hypothesize that the conceptual aspect of our, of our narrative identity rooted in our memories and concepts might be more related to the default mode network, 
Whereas the other aspect could be related to other networks uh, or other regions, such as the salience network or um, kind of certain other areas in the brain related to spatial location. And so I think uh, to link it unequivocally, ego dissolution to equal default mode network is a big simplification. Mm. Um, yeah. <laughs> There's more to go into, but I don't want to keep going on and on. <laughs> Well, it's. I, I just had this interesting conversation with uh, Dr. Melanie Pincus preparing for this serotonergic uh, neuroscience class that we're putting on, <clears throat> and uh, she just brought up an interesting point about like ego dissolution and mystical experiences because it does seem like there's that correlation there, and. I guess she, one question she asked me was like, you know, do you need to have ego dissolution to have a mystical experience? Um, mm -hmm. And is ego dissolution always involved in mystical experiences? Um, and I was really trying to think about some of my previous experiences where I've had ego dissolution, where I didn't know who I was. I didn't know my name. I didn't know anything about myself. But would I necessarily classify that as mystical? Mm -hmm. And then like, what is a mystical experience? Um, yeah, yeah. Because I think a lot of people do read some of that research and they go, I need to have an ego death or, or ego dissolution experience to have a mystical experience. Um, yeah. And are they the same? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. Well, I mean, it comes down to, in the scientific context, what the measures are we're using to index these things, right? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, if we look at the mystical experience questionnaire, mm -hmm. um, it basically takes um, different dimensions you know, from, I think, Wal Walter Stace, this philosopher in the 60s, uh, and also Walter Panke's research, um, kind of like how ineffable was the experience? Uh, you know, did you have an experience of unity? Did you have um, bliss? What, did you have a feeling of sacredness? And it was these distinct measures which were explicitly drawn from quote-unquote mystical experiences in saints and mystics, etc. So basically drawing from the religious literature and getting these measures. Um, and in that context, they don't typically describe ego dissolution per se. They, they describe experiences of unity, you know, external and internal unity. Um, whereas ego dissolution is a kind of more isolated, specific thing you're trying to get at of, of feeling like you're blending with other people and in, in the environment and having a, a less of a sense of your own importance uh, and this kind of thing. So I think, you know, for one, mystical experiences are very, I think, not well characterized in the research. And this is a very yeah. simplified, you know, uh, 30 measures. It's like one to seven. How much did you have an experience that was ineffable <laughs> or how much, uh, how, yeah. how, how sacred did this experience <laughs> feel? And you could see how those are very like low resolution things to be asking. Right. Um, and so I think ego dissolution right now is a component of the mystical experience questionnaire in that the mystical experience questionnaire really highlights unity experiences of unity in it. Um, but yeah, as you're saying, Kyle, like you can have that ego dissolution experience, but you don't necessarily need to also have all that sacredness and bliss and all these other experiences. So there seems to be distinct psychological phenomena occurring, right? Um, so it's a really interesting question. Like why does some ego dissolution experiences come along with all these other things? And sometimes why, why doesn't it? And is the ego dissolution in a mystical experience qualitatively different than ego dissolution on its own right mm -hmm. and, and this stuff we don't know and like even yeah. the range of possible mystical experiences is is far beyond just like one unitary thing as well right if you look at any religious literature or even religious studies uh, publications and reports like it, there's a huge variety, variability of types of experiences right so yeah <laughs> Super fascinating. So fascinating. Mm -hmm. I know. I'm like, I really want to start talking about all my own personal experiences. I don't think this is the time or place, <laughs> but it's really, it's something I've also been thinking about a lot. But yeah, I think this does lead us pretty well to this recent creativity study that you were the lead author on uh, in 2020, um, updating the dynamic framework of thought, creativity, and psychedelics. Um, I think this is like really mm -hmm. interesting. And I'd love for you to explain, maybe start with like, why, why you wanted to do the study and what you were looking for, and then maybe move into, you know, what you guys found. Totally, totally. So it's primarily, it was a theoretical paper with some uh, research findings uh, that are motivated by it. And what's interesting is actually a recent paper done at Maastricht, uh, led by Natasha Mason and others, 
actually explicitly drew from this model that I proposed and tested it in a, in a study. And we can oh, talk cool. about their results. So that was really cool for me to see. Like, wow, people actually use this paper. Um, yeah, that's amazing. But, um, yeah, please. Yeah, yeah let's go. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Get to that, please. Yeah, but start, I think, yeah, like where where you yeah. started and then mm-hmm. how it's ended up for sure. <laughs> totally. So um, within the context of the lab I was working in, we talked about, right, during mind-wandering, daydreaming. Um, in that lab, they've been developing this model of different types of thought, uh, which kind of interlinks them. So interlinking you know, uh, spontaneous mind wandering to rumination, to focused goal driven thought, as you, you could call it to dreaming, to creativity and kind of mapping them in terms of how much constraint is imposed on them. Okay. Mm. And so, and so, so there's two types of constraints. One, and we can call them automatic constraints. Basically it's an emotional constraint. And the other type of constraint is deliberate constraint. So consciously choosing to constrain. As an example, if you're trying to solve a specific task, you're very deliberately constrained because you're deliberately controlling your attention. And in the ideal case, your emotion is not driving your attention at that point. You want to focus and let go of whatever emotion, right? Whereas if you're, rum- if you're ruminating, you have depression, you no longer really have deliberate control over your thought. It's like fully emotion dri- driven and you're kind of getting pulled like, you know, into this well, like it's like a gravity yeah. well uh, and you can't escape it, right? Yeah. And, and so like there's these two dimensions of thought. And uh, the thoughts, the types of thought I just listed all fall in different parts on here. And I was like, hey, the psychedelic experience can map onto this chart too. Um, and basically in this dynamic framework of thought, I was kind of arguing that it's, it falls in a similar place as dreaming uh, a lot of the times. Because dreaming is a state where there's relatively less deliberate you know, uh, constraint. You're not controlling it in a conscious way. Um, and less emotional because you're just, it's almost like bizarre free flow content coming up, right? <laughs> Unless it's a nightmare. And in some cases it can get emotional, but it's more so unconstrained. And uh, I was like, also with psychedelics, it's uh, for the most part, it seems to be free flowing and unconstrained. Um, and, uh, you know, you're, you have less control over what's happening. And it's kind of uh, interesting because other research has explicitly linked psychedelic experiences to the dream state, right? And seeing that they're phenomenologically similar. Uh, there's a lot of overlap in, in a number of different uh, ways of looking at it. And um, so then on the basis of that, I was like, okay, so we, if we conceptualize psychedelics as almost being like dreaming, but awake, then that could be a great source of novel ideas and creative ideas. Cause you now you're in this mental state that's unconstrained by logic. It's unconstrained by, you know, a need to make sense. And you kind of, you can get this more free flow of ideas. And then, so I was making the argument in that, uh, paper, like, like, yeah, since psychedelics fall in this part of this map because of X, Y, and Z reasons, therefore it's a good candidate for the generation of creative ideas. And um, we kind of link this to brain findings too, trying to relate it to interactions between the DFMO network and um, other networks uh, like the frontal parietal control network, which is kind of your prefrontal cortex. You could think of it as that. And um, yeah, trying to link those together. And then, um, so we created that model and it was basically also a way for me to, a kind of a sneaky way for me to bring psychedelics and pull them into this mainstream research, right? <laughs> that was kind of my ulterior <laughs> motive there to bring it into this. And, um, and then, so then we looked at it and there were changes in the DeFi mode network that related to people's reports of um, having original ideas or insightful ideas under, under LSD, uh, for example, in one of the studies uh, conducted. So, so there might be a connection there uh, based on that data. Um, yeah, so that was that paper. I, I hope, is there any questions you guys have or anything I didn't, wasn't clear? No, that's super clear. And then, yeah, so then how did these other scientists apply your theory, right? Totally, totally. So like in that original paper, how I had tested it was using this already collected data. It wasn't data that was collected for the purpose of testing it, right? Um, and so, you know, uh, Natasha Mason, Kim Coopers, uh, and others at Maastricht, um, decided to study it in an actual, you know, placebo controlled, double blind, uh, randomized study, uh, like good science, rigorous study. And, um, so they wanted to see, uh, using that framework as kind of the motivation for it, whether, uh, different measures of divergent and convergent thinking were mm-hmm. changed. And, um, so, 
like divergent thinking is basically creativity, right? And how, the main measure they used was the, uh, what's called the picture concept task. And so basically what do you, what they do is they give you rows of images, right? Let's say that you have three o- rows of objects. And what you have to do is find one object in each, um, that are associated with each other. So it's like pick one from each row and that are associated in some way. And now there's one right answer, which is an obvious answer almost. It's like all bathroom items, right? Or something like that. And then the task is now to come up with as many other uses among or associations between these pictures as you can, right? Um, to to mm. find, find like just crazy, bizarre ways to make it work. <laughs> and then you're measured on how many associations did you come up with? How original were they relative to all the other participants? Mm. And also your ratio of original to number of ideas. So like what are the quality of the ideas overall, right? And uh, the results were actually interesting. And this opens up a whole other can of worms in terms of psychedelics and creativity, which I didn't get into actually based on my paper. But um, actually during the acute psilocybin experience, measures of um, number of ideas and the originality of the ideas actually decreased under psilocybin. So there was less. Mm. Um, and uh, and but what was interesting in self-report ratings of perceived insightfulness um, <laughs> outside the context of the task of just like having the experience were higher, right? As, as you might guess. So people felt like they were having insights into things and having original ideas. But when you had them sit down and look at these rows of images and try to come up with stuff, they were doing uh, worse than placebo. Uh, huh. But what's interesting is when they were measured again a week later, the psilocybin group had increased as under the measures. So it's like acutely it seemed to disrupt their ability to solve this creativity task, but a week later they had improvements relative to placebo. And um, and those improvements relative to placebo at one week were correlated with some of the changes during the experience too. And so you get this complex picture where, you know, maybe in the acute experience, at least with that task and that dosage, people weren't able to do that, you know, uh, task particularly well, but there seems to be some sustained change in them that led them to be creative after. And, and, and as, a, as an additional thing, like the default mode network is related to the perception of insightfulness during the experience and also the, the improvements that they got in certain measures a week later. Um, and this opens mm. a whole can of worms, but I'll let you guys ask if you guys have any questions or. Yeah. It just makes me think about like, I guess like the neuroplasticity effect, but also just this idea of like disintegration in the psychedelic experience. And then over time integration of that information um, mm-hmm. and, you know, it may seem really chaotic and doesn't make sense within the psychedelic experience, but maybe as the week goes on, you start connecting the dots as maybe those networks start to come back online in different ways. Yeah, it could very well be like kind of like a sustained afterglow when you're feeling a bit more loose and, and kind of uh, less kind of bogged down after the experience, right? And therefore, yeah, you have that boost a, a week later. You feel a bit more flexible, right? Like a little less rigid in the way you're always thinking about things, but that can very often mm-hmm. come back, right? And so, like, I guess I keep wondering, like, can psychedelics really make us more creative or are they just like making us a little bit more flexible or do you have any ideas on this? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I it's I very bet. interesting. I mean, <laughs> for one, we, we don't really, we can't say, uh, we, we can't say that we know for sure. Mm-hmm. So again, this is like one, this is like the first placebo controlled, you know, uh, randomized study in this area in the modern period, you know, of, of doing this. Uh, or maybe ever, I don't know if they did randomized controlled ones back in the 60s and stuff. But um, I, I think that, you know, whether psychedelics, hmm, I think the way that psychedelics might boost creativity is in specific contexts and specific ways, right? So in this study, um, they have them sit down at a computer and do a specific task after taking a bunch of psilocybin, right? No. And you can understand that when you're in that state, you kind of not really down for that. Yeah. Right? I'm like looking at uh, a computer screen on psilocybin. No way. No way. <laughs> yeah. And, and there is research showing that people's ability to sustain their attention and suppress distractors is impaired. Exactly. Like, yeah. like obviously. Right. Uh, <laughs> and and so therefore it's hard to do this constrained, almost contrived tasks of, oh, find associations between these random images. Um, and so there's this distinction between objective creativity, which is performance on tasks and subjective creativity, you know, which is how much do you feel like you're having insightful ideas? Um, and then kind of parallel to that is this distinction between spontaneous creativity and deliberate creativity. 
or spontaneous creativity is like you're just doing your thing, having your experience, and are you having these random insights into, into what might be personal or about things you've just you know you reflect on your life um, and kind of just happen on their own of in the ideas and insights that just come versus deliberate of you. I need to solve this particular task and come up with creative things for it, right? And so my hunch is that psychedelics mostly improve our spontaneous creativity. So the one mm -hmm. that is not tied to a specific task and, um, and perhaps also mess with our subjective sense of how creative ideas, uh, our ideas are, right? Make us uh, often over kind of sensationalize our ideas, which of course is classic psychedelic <laughs> effect to do that. Um, which is not to say all ideas are just nonsense, right? But like uh, we have a greater tendency to attribute significance to things that are maybe not significant. And so it's kind of a mess of things, right? And so it's hard to tease out what is actually going on in, in this area. I wonder how that hypothesis of like deliberate versus spontaneous creativity kind of pushes up against like what's been going on in like Silicon Valley with like microdosing, creativity, productivity, being very deliberate with, I want to try to complete this ta task or, you know, get creative on a certain solution versus I'm just thinking about like, you know, some of the, the geniuses throughout the century having more spontaneous insight um, around their, um, you know, inventions or their ideas where it just maybe came to them through a dream yeah. and then yeah. they decided to explore mm -hmm. that a little bit more. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, it's interesting. Cause yeah, Silicon Valley, presumably a lot of these are, are software engineers trying to come up with some novel, you know, solution to some problem with their code or, or come up with product ideas and stuff like this. I mean, I guess those two are different, but I would say dosage is a major player here, right? Mm. Whereas maybe in deliberate types of creativity, uh, micro doses are better, lower doses are better. Um, but in spontaneous, uh, you might be better off taking larger dose and having these other larger insights, right? Um, so there could be domain specific based on the dose. I think mm. that's what will end up being the case. Yeah. And the substance, like if this did become like more of a, you know, accepted popular field of study or even like something that was accepted to go to a clinic and use, I do feel like. Yeah, I mean, everyone's different, but I think different people would prefer maybe LSD for problem solving and psilocybin for, you know, maybe insight onto yourself. Or, I mean, these are just from personal experience, but it's really interesting. I keep thinking yeah, yeah. like, you know, also when you were talking like, yeah, like everything on psychedelics like feels really profound, but you can kind of like really feel yourself. I'm like, man, I'm so profound right now. Like, because it is kind of just like how the psychedelic experience I don't know. It's a really big part of it. And I also just keep thinking like, do psychedelics make folks more creative or are creative people drawn to psychedelics, you know, like chicken or egg type mm. of thing. I think, I think it's both. I think these things can definitely go both ways, but I just do hope there's more research into mm -hmm. this field. Cause I think there's a general feeling that yes, yeah, psychedelics make people more creative and people are already doing it. So to maybe like have some more concrete data, like the dosage, the substance, the person could be really fascinating. Just yeah. this idea of like creativity. I come back to something with like what Terrence McKenna said. Um, like I, I'm thinking like creativity is more like productivity, like to be creative, to do something that puts something out into the world um, mm -hmm. versus like Terrence McKenna just saying uh, psychedelics tend to promote funny ideas. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And are funny ideas always productive? I don't know. They're just right. weird and ridiculous sometimes. Yeah, totally. And what's interesting is in the in the scientific research, how creativity is defined as ideas that are both novel and useful. Huh. And so mm -hmm. the usefulness is the important part there, right? Because uh, you can have novel, like, what was it, silly ideas or like crazy ideas. You can have all these ideas, but uh, if they're just bizarre things that don't make any sense, they're not really useful, right? Um, they might be fun. They might be artistic perhaps. Right. But they're not useful in some sense. Uh, I was going to say an artist, I mean, really getting into those funny ideas or concepts and artistic expression to an artist. I'm sure that's super creative. Yeah. And here's the thing under usefulness actually is, is, um, appropriate and, and valuable. So hmm. I guess appropriate for some artistic aim, but, uh, but yeah, it gets, it gets messy. Right. But, uh, but yeah, I think there is definitely value in exploring funny ideas in a particular context, right? Because then we get into the question of creativity in engineering versus art versus science versus et cetera. Yeah. And then you get into more distinctions, right? On the, what, what might be suitable for improving that domain. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's so interesting. And it really also like 
depends on how you continue to like integrate those funny ideas. Maybe there are like lessons in there. Maybe they're not really specific toward creativity, but maybe more in like the healing realms, like, oh, why do I have these funny ideas? Or there's just so many questions you could ask yourself and roads to go down, which actually reminds mm-hmm. me of something else I wanted to to ask you now, um, you mentioned this earlier that you'd be down to talk about like, you know, is the psychedelic experience really, really necessary maybe for psychedelic healing, right? And like how necessary are the funny ideas Mm -hmm. and the big colorful visual experiences or however you experience psychedelics to this more, you know, useful use of psychedelics, right? In this kind of context for depression or other mental Mm -hmm, health mm -hmm. conditions. Yeah, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, yeah. Totally. So there's so many things to go into here. <laughs> I guess I guess to start to link it to what we were just discussing, there's the concept of psychological flexibility. Now, this is distinct from cognitive flexibility, right? Where cognitive flexibility is like how how much are you able to, you know, switch between different approaches to a problem or uh, perspectives on something in kind of a very cognitive way where psychological flexibility is like, how much are you in touch with right now in this moment and flexibly adapting to the situation and doing things that are consistent with your values? You could say that's mm-hmm. kind of psychological flexibility. And in, in psychology and neuroscience research, they do make the distinction between cognitive and psychological yeah. flexibility. Um, so psychological flexibility, you know, seems to be uh, potentially a mediator of, you know, the positive effects of, of psychedelic experiences and mystical experiences in particular. So, you know, uh, so in general, the research on clinical trials have, have suggested that the treatment benefits come from people who have greater mystical type experiences and the mystical experiences lead to greater psychological flexibility or where it basically uh, allows people to reconnect with themselves and what they value and who they are. And, you know, go from, go from there, you know, go from this moment and make the next decision forward as opposed to being bogged down in automatic, you know, patterns and, uh, unconscious tendencies and all the rest. And, um, so there is a large amount of research showing how the acute experience is related to treatment efficacy, right? Which makes sense because, you know, psychedelics need you on this psychological journal journey, journey of healing of, uh, you know, uncovering repressed memories and releasing emotions and having new insights. And it's a very, psychological process that involves your active involvement, you know, includes your active involvement and you're actually making effort to create lasting change and healing in your psyche and then integrating it after, which is essential. And so that's the standard narrative, but then, okay. So then given that, and given the scientific evidence for that, why are people saying that, uh, you know, we can try creating these drugs without the trip and see, and they will probably still give benefits, right? Um, And so the idea there comes from neuroplasticity, right? So psychedelic, uh, the serotonin 2A agonist um, boosts neuroplasticity in the brain, which basically means it gives your brain more resources to create new connections between neurons and reorganize or alter existing connections. And one of the hallmarks of different disorders, especially depression, is that your brain becomes less plastic. It has less, you know, brain drive neurotrophic factor and other markers of neuroplasticity. And basically your brain becomes more rigid. And, um, and the idea is that there are certain maladaptive or negative brain circuits, which contribute to rumination or, you know, uh, cynicism or nihilism or whatever, these things that are not very, um, kind of healthy for your well-being, Uh, and we kind of get locked in through these rigid brain circuits Mm -hmm. and that, um, and there's also studies with, in depressed, I think rats showing depressed uh, symptoms uh, that if you inject them with BDNF, they, you know, their depression seems to improve. Their quote unquote depression seems to improve. And so it seems like boosting the plasticity of the brain itself um, helps relieve uh, certain symptoms, presumably by giving your brain these new resources to break out of these rigid maladaptive brain circuits, right? And so, and so the idea is that psychedelics by boosting plasticity are tapping into this mechanism as well. And so therefore, is it actually the case that that's what's making the changes? And we just think it's all this fun experience that we're going through, you know, uh, that's what, that's kind of the argument in a, in a nutshell is that, you know, it might seem like the psychological processing and these insights are, are leading us to be healthier and overcome our depression, but maybe it's just really hard hardware level things in the terms of the, you know, material substrate of our brain and our connections between neurons, um, being changed without our conscious awareness necessarily. Hmm. Um, 
And so that's the general idea. And so what I think is that, because, uh, okay, well, the idea that plasticity alone can increase, you know, the reduce these symptoms, it's consistent with ketamine research, right? Where a lot of the times in the context where ketamine is applied for depression, they devalue the experience. They're like, mm -hmm. oh, you'll have these unwanted dissociative yeah. symptoms, but ignore those and you'll be better. Don't worry, you know, which is really kind of terrible, as I'm sure you guys <laughs> would agree. Of the, yeah, a lot to say there. But, <laughs> but the idea is that it's boosting neuroplasticity because ketamine does that potently. And that's the, you know, the mechanism a lot of people emphasize, that it boosts plasticity and the experience doesn't matter. And that's why you get better. And so uh, people are just thinking that, you know, psilocybin and LSD might be similar. But the thing with ketamine is that usually you have to take repeated dosing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, you know, it expects maybe last week, two weeks if you're lucky, and then you got to do it again. Um, and that's because I believe you're not have you, in that context, you're not working through the psychological content that mer emerge. You're not making real lasting change. You're just getting this little push for a bit, and then you fall back into your patterns and you get a push, you fall back. And um, if you want to be cynical, like, pharmaceutical companies will like that model because that means you're a, you're a returning customer indefinitely. Right. Right. And, and so like when I see psychedelics trying to be put into that, um, into that box, it's like, they're perhaps they're just trying to make a sustained treatment model that requires repeated dosing and repeated profits. And I think having uh, robbing the, ex the ex pulling the experience out of the psychedelics, um, will just lead to short-term benefits, perhaps, uh, similar to ketamine, like a week, two weeks where you get this boost in plasticity. But if you're not, actively in your life making certain changes to make lasting changes use that neuroplasticity in a proper right. way or you're not really trying to work through your problems it's not going to translate into long-term benefits you're just going to be dependent on a drug like you are with you know ssris and all these other terrible drugs that people get stuck on right so mm -hmm. and i guess it kind of comes back to a, a conversation we were having with dr robin carhar harris earlier just this idea of like what is mental illness and you know does it exist in the brain and we were talking a little bit about like germ theory bacteria viruses we can find that um with mental health you know there has been this big narrative around like chemical imbalances and pharmacological interventions are perfect for you know mediating that and uh, shifting that mm -hmm. and so yeah does that start to really rely back then on the chemical imbalance model producing drugs to um you know change brain chemistry versus I guess this psychedelic model where it's like you have you know Michelle I think you're pointing at this it's pharmacological but there's also like this other aspect of deep insight personal direct experience with something that also helps to mediate change um, and yeah what's going on there right and we were talking a little bit yeah. about environment has played mm -hmm. a huge fact on on mental health um, in general and you know Totally. Is it something that we can find? And um, I guess it makes me go come back to uh, Wilder Penfield. I think he mm -hmm. had a, a statement saying, uh, mind is beyond the brain. And so how are we even defining mind, mental health, and, and all this stuff to begin with? Is it just yeah. you know organic in the brain that we need to mess around totally. with? Yeah, it's fascinating that Wilder Penfield said that because he was famous for stimulating people's brains and getting them to react in certain ways, right? And if he is making that statement, there's some reason for it, right? He's seeing the limitations of that model. Um, and yeah, the whole chemical imbalance thing, it's like, for one, there's not nearly as much evidence for a lot of the things that people claim, um, you know, uh, that they, than they think there is. And a lot of the times these drugs were, were discovered first and then a mechanism was proposed after, right? It's not like, they discovered, uh, you know, depression was due to uh, an imbalance of serotonin. And they're like, oh, can we devise things that would that fix that? It's like they found they had drugs initially, which had the side effect of improving depression. And then they found they work on the serotonin system. And they're like, oh, probably there was a serotonin imbalance that it's fixing. Um, but the research is very uh, equivocal. It hasn't like shown that definitively. And it's kind of a narrative that's almost suppressed, ignored, right? And that um, has a psychedelic history with Woolley finding, um, discovering serotonin um, around the mm -hmm. same time as LSD and making those correlations. To yeah, see. yeah, totally. And so, yeah, it's, and I think as you were saying too, I, and I know Robin is really thinking about this stuff too, is like the psychosocial approach, right? It's like, mm -hmm. we're not just brains that were just kind of disconnected from the external environment, just floating around in, in our heads. It's like, we're like deeply intertwined with the collective, with society, with people around us, with our nutrition, with everything going on. 
And so therefore, you know, taking all these, these things into account are important, not just forget the whole systemic cause for your issue, take this drug and maybe you will feel better in almost like a brave new world type way. <laughs> right. And that's the standard way of approaching it a lot of times. And, and then, so it irks me when they're trying to put psychedelics into this box too, you know, with these different things, which I think often are just a, yeah, I think a, a lot of the push to fit psychedelics into this pharmaceutical box of take it and you'll get better. Don't worry about the experience. Don't worry about processing anything. Don't worry about any effort. It's just like, <laughs> Again, a, kind of like a fear of altered states almost, a fear of uh, facing our demons, potentially having uncomfortable experiences and doing the real psychological work. It's like, you know, kind of like, oh, why would we go through that anxiety and, and negative experience when we could just feel better with this drug that we take every day um, instead, right? And that's kind of the approach a lot of the time, which disempowers people to play an, an active role in their mental health and just leads them to just like outsource their own mental health to psychiatrists who, you know, a lot of times have drug money and want to give you these drugs to use, right? Um, so I think psychedelics by emphasizing the internal aspect and the inner work aspect and the healing psychological um, process uh, is really like, it's great and is what's going to help people actually get over things and not be dependent, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Do you see any benefit in any of that type of drug development? Yeah, I mean, for some people who are just not ready for a psychedelic experience and who are just not ready to face their deepest demons, especially people who've undergone a lot of, you know, intense suffering in their life. Uh, some people, and, and perhaps people who have schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, who are avoided in the current trials, although that might change in the future. But like mm -hmm. for these people who it, it is, or people with cardiac, you know, problems. Oh, right. So for these people, these kind of drugs uh, might be useful to help, you know, uh, you know, it, it's probably better than what's currently out there to have a, you know, a non-psychedelic analog of psilocybin as opposed to an SSRI or antipsychotic or something like this, right? Um, it could be a step up from that, but it's still not the ideal in making lasting changes in people. But I think definitely, I'm not opposed to the development of these drugs. I think they'll play their pace, but I don't think they'll replace the full normal psychedelics. Yeah, I even think of like uh, conditions like cluster headaches, right? If somebody's yeah. really just trying to treat that pain, uh, you know, do you want to take a psychedelic trip all the time or would you want a substance that might possibly? Because, I mean, what's going on there is, I mean, that seems maybe a little bit more organic in nature of the, mm -hmm. the headache. Um, yeah. But I don't know. Maybe there is some psychosomatic probably. I'm like stress maybe could, or something yeah. though, right? Like I feel like they yeah, probably yeah. everything is psychosomatic, but I see your point. Absolutely. But no, I keep um, thinking about what, what Manesh was just saying and it resonated with me a lot because when we do try to put the psychedelic experience into this, like, well, take it away and just like take the pill every day and don't think about your problems, right? Don't do the work to maybe like get to the root of them and move on. It really like... Yeah, it doesn't put any responsibility on people, which is like, you know, I can see the appeal from a corporate <laughs> point of view, but, you know, psychedelics really have taught me anything. Mm -hmm. It's my own agency, right? And I think that's such a beautiful lesson that humans really need, especially right now when we just outsource everything, you know, we buy all our food and yeah. plastic and we never, we don't have to do anything really to stay alive, just make money. And it, it's not that natural. And, and, and something about psychedelics is just so utterly natural to me and, and I don't, I hope that that's not like the um, only future mm. for, you know, psychedelics and medicine, because that would be sad. <laughs> um, so thank you for saying that. I think that was like yeah, just a really yeah. nuanced uh, approach to this. I really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. For sure. For sure. I had a, a conversation with uh, Dr. Matthew Johnson a bit ago, and um, mm -hmm. this this might be just interesting from a neuroscience perspective since you're studying neuroscience, but this idea of using psychedelics to understand consciousness mm. um, right. and brain mechanism. And I guess like, what's your thought around this? Mm. Yeah. And I think this is what I think Matthew also emphasizes. It's a distinction between the mind and consciousness, right? It's like our cognitive abilities are aspects of our conscious experience, like the contents versus consciousness itself, which is like the hard problem and the easy problem mm -hmm. as I was often frame, right? It's like, will psychedelics give us insight into what the, the essential metaphysical nature of consciousness, like probably not as arguable, right? Like you can never really definitively know that, um, you can have experiences which seem to suggest they're more real than real, et cetera, but there's no way to, as a matter of faith at some point, um, just as anything is almost, <laughs> you know, to some degree. <laughs> 
But um, so we can't know definitively. We just have to like, I think the knowing will come in an intuitive way that can't be explained or convinced unless you have the experience yourself and, and choose to believe mm -hmm. it. Um, but I think on the other side, for things like understanding, perhaps, you know, our sense of self in the brain, you know, uh, dissecting that, like how, mm -hmm. what composes it, what happens when it's perturbed, what happens when different aspects of it are perturbed and psychedelics are probably better than anything I know of to help uh, potentially uncover that with smart paradigms for studying it, et cetera. Right. And, um, also things like cognitive flex flexibility, maybe creativity and, uh, this kind of stuff like psychedelics by inducing these states, which in which these cognitive abilities are dramatically changed, we're opening up a window to test them in different ways. Right. So I think they can be used to study different cognitive behavioral, perceptual, emotional, perhaps like phenomena. But in terms of consciousness itself, that's left to, I guess, mystics and philosophers, not really, <laughs> you know, psychedelic science. Yeah. yeah. Oh, interesting. Yeah. I just keep thinking about, you know, there's this idea and I've, I, I believe in it, but I, I don't think there's any proof that psychedelics can make us more self-aware. Right. And I guess I wonder, like, is that related to consciousness or could that be related to like more cognitive flexibility? And could there be any way to test that? <laughs> what do you think? Yeah. How it's usually framed as, is as metacognition. Right. I'm not sure if you heard that term, but that's how research is metacognition or meta awareness. It's like awareness of awareness. You know, yeah. you make, let's say you have a perception of something, you're aware you had that perception, but then there's this, you're aware that you are aware that you have that perception. It's like, right? but then what? What's uh, the next kind of, step? Right. Like, how do you change right, that perception right. too? <laughs> right. Right. But, uh, but I think, I mean, I would say that psychedelics do make people more self-aware just because they allow us again to escape our usual frame of reference to uh, escape our habitual thought patterns and come out of it. So then we could see those old ones as an object in mm -hmm. our ex perceptual, in our experience. And by doing that, that's like a level up in self-awareness because if you're bogged down in your ego narrative and this is my life and this is everything I am, my identity and all this, then you can't see it for what it is. But if you have a psychedelic or you're a meditator, et cetera, then you come out and see that and you're like, whoa, like, you know, I thought that was all that existed. I thought that was all me. And that's an up, that's a leveling up in self-awareness in my view. Right. And so that hasn't really been studied scientifically, but I'm sure it, it can be in some degree in the future. Um, and I, I would anticipate probably would find out to, it to be the case, at least to some degree. Speaking of the future, where do you see some of like, I don't know, I guess, what are your visions for psychedelics? Like, what are the potentials here with psychedelics? And maybe, I don't know if it's within your context of neuroscience, if it's outside of it, like, um, I don't know what excites you the most. <laughs> yeah. A lot of things. I mean, <laughs> one, they're just intrinsically fascinating and I'm excited to see what we uncover with the science moving forward. Uh, but also I think just, I mean, there's a whole number of things, but obviously psychedelics aren't a panacea that are going to work for everybody and solve everything. Uh, but I think what they do do is they draw attention to the need for inner work and the possibility of radical change, of uh, personal transformation. Because a lot of people like, you know, in the thirties, forties and above perhaps are like, oh, this is who I am now. This, this anxiety, this depression, this, you know, these bad habits, that's just me. That's just who I am. And which is a profoundly limiting narrative to take on. But like a lot of people have that. Right. And I think even not even going through a psychedelic experience themselves, but seeing other people in the, in the media or their friends, uh, of being able to change. They're like, oh, there's hope for changing and there's hope for, yeah, for transformation. Mm -hmm. and, and in this world where things are rapidly progressing and changing and, you know, the major skill that we need to know now is how to learn and then unlearn and then learn <laughs> again and, and kind of swap between different realms and, and domains and all of this, right? Like flexibility and less of an attachment to who we are, how we are, what we can do is essential for being successful, healthy, integrated people, you know, ever, but also more and more so, right? So I think psychedelics can draw attention to possibilities in these areas and, um, you know, help people uh, move into that in a greater degree, whether it's like they're depressed and they're kind of on this side of the spectrum um, and they need to get back to baseline or people at baseline who want to become more healthy, integrated, creative, you know, people. Um, I think for both of those, uh, psychedelics present uh, a real potential opportunity to grow in these ways. Again, when, the, you know, when they're done with the proper uh, integration after and, you know, preparation context, all this kind of stuff and making the conscious changes in their life to implement it. I think there's huge potential there uh, for, for these things to happen on a wider scale and to be acknowledged. 
I think that's, that's what I'm really excited about in, in a broad sense. Excellent. Awesome. Yeah, me too. Anything that you're currently <laughs> working on or studies like that you want to do in the future? Anything you want to, yeah, end on like cool stuff to look out for? Yeah, totally. So, hmm. Few things like one. Okay, when uh, one of the things I'm working on right now is, as I kind of mentioned, a comparison of psilocybin, LSD, and DMT in the brain cool. using brain imaging, because I mean, a, a lot of studies to date have kind of looked at the different drugs in isolation, a so couple with LSD and psilocybin, but none have looked at all three and really looked at like what's similar, what's different in terms of the brain activity, because uh, often they're grouped in two-way agonist psychedelics as if they're all the same, right? But they're obviously not in a mm-hmm. number of different ways. And I think uh, it'd be interesting as research, as more data is collected to tease apart those differences. And then we can do what you were saying, Michelle, of, of seeing uh, whether certain drugs can be uh, proven or shown to be better for certain disorders or ones better for creativity, this kind of thing. And that's, that's the psychedelic science of the future. Cool. In a sense. So exciting. Um, and something I'm also interested in is, yeah, teasing apart these things like cognitive flexibility and creativity. It's like, what is really going on there? You know, how do we tease apart all these moving parts of, you know, we talked about spontaneous versus deliberate, objective, subjective, cognitive flexibility, psychological flexibility. How do all these relate to changes in these treatment paradigms? How do they relate to memory? How do they relate to all these different things, right? And it's like so fascinating. And I, I think that's what I intend on uh, studying in the future, like after my PhD and beyond particularly. Awesome. Yeah. Are you getting close to the end of the PhD program? I have two more years, actually. Uh, 2023 is when I'll be finished. And as of right now, there's a 99% chance that I'm going to be joining uh, Robin and Adam Gasly at DUCSF. Cool, at the Neuroscape Uh, uh, Psychedelic Division? Exactly. So that's the plan right now to do the stuff I was just talking about in some capacity. So exciting. So everybody listening, be sure to keep Keep tabs on Manesh. She's going to do some wonderful things. I can yeah. feel it. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. <laughs> Lots of exciting stuff to come in the field for sure. Where can people find you? Do you have an online? Well, obviously, a psychedelic scientist, but yeah, um, yeah. yeah. What are your What are your channels? Where can people find you? Totally. So uh, personally, I have my personal Twitter, which is mgirnero, which is M G I R N N E U R O. So at I'm going M at Emger Nero, <laughs> which is my Twitter handle. And then uh, the Psychedelic Scientist on YouTube and Instagram I'm also active on there. Uh, those two ways as well. Those are the best ways to find me. Awesome. Awesome, Inesh. Well, this has been really awesome. Anything that you want to close with that may feel left unsaid? Um, no, I think I'm very complete. This is a great conversation. I really enjoyed chatting with you guys. And it's such an honor to be on Psychedelics today as well. I've listened to many podcasts, et cetera, on there. So oh, thank you. It's great for me to chat with you guys. Thank you so much. Likewise. I've learned so much from this conversation. I really appreciate it. And I am also very much looking forward to your work. I think you have a really great point of view on this stuff and really exciting things to come. So just thank you for your contribution. Amazing. Thanks so much. 